Hi there. Nice to meet you online. You too. Here. I'm Elizabeth. Oh, hey, Elizabeth. Yeah, really nice to meet you. You got a very nice scene behind you there. Oh, yes. It's my uh, it's big country estate. Oh, oh cool. <laughs> and where are you located? Southwest uh, Mississauga. Oh, okay, cool. I got a sister yeah. in Oakville. Yeah, so I go out there all the time. It's a beautiful spot. And where are you? I'm in Toronto, near Dufferin and Eglinton. Okay. Yeah, nice. little Jamaica, but it doesn't feel like that right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now tell me something, uh, have you been playing already? Yeah, I just took some private lessons um, starting beginning of the summer. Okay, yeah. and how's it going? Yeah, and I, I did focus on, I wanted to learn more of the fiddling style, so um, yeah. it was a classical teacher who was teaching me, but he did... He taught me some fiddle tunes. Okay. And who is your and teacher? From this book. I don't know this book. It's called I've, Fiddle Works. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. Anyway, there's basic stuff in there. Well, that's cool. And how are you getting along with it so far? Uh, it's, um, it's very humbling. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like, it's, it's, but it's the most amazing instrument. Like, it's, um, it gives back so much. Like I play flute and piano, and it's just there's something completely different about violin. Cool. So you play flute and piano already? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. That that sure is a leg up. You know, having some grounding is is really good. So good to hear. But yes, you're right. It's it does give a lot back, but it costs quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. We'll figure it out. Now we got some other people coming here. <clears throat> Headache. <laughs> oh, no. Headache. I like that. <laughs> well, I don't like that. It sucks, but it does happen. There's Elaine. Hi, Elaine. Okay, there's Julie. Lots of people signing on here. Actually, you know, I'm going <sighs> to... Mm -hmm. Okay. There's Deborah. Hi, Deborah. Hi, nice to meet you. There's Julie. Hi, Julie. How you doing? Hi, Dan. How's it going? Oh, not too bad. Get myself organized here. Oh, good. Good, good. Hi, Stacy. Hello. Nice to meet you. You too. Thanks. Yeah. Nice to see everybody here. There's Joanne. Oh, hey, Joanne. I liked your screen thing that said headache. <laughs> Oh no? Oh, that's not yours, no. But I, I, I am not feeling that great, so I may not last the whole time. <laughs> oh, okay, that's all right, don't worry about it. There will be lots of talking tonight anyway, because we have some new faces that just joined us. And a couple of people are right out of the box, so we'll be talking about, you know, holding it and, and talking to it and trying to beat some sense into it there when you first start off, so, so it'll be an easier night anyway. Now, Stacy, are you one of those right out of the box people? You know I am. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And where are you located again? <laughs> I'm in Newmarket, so just outside of Toronto. Newmarket, cool. Right on. All righty. Yeah. Hi there. Hi, headache. <laughs> Who's headache? That's what your screen says. It says headache. Oh, that's from my last Zoom. I'm fine tonight. <laughs> Can you remind me of your name I again? Am Heather. Heather, okay. Oh yeah, Heather. Heather. Yeah, that's uh, that's yeah. Lena's mom. Yeah, Lena's mom. Cool. Okay. I haven't seen Lena show up yet, but she said she might be late, I think. <clears throat> and Deborah, where are you located? I'm in Lower Mill Stream, New Brunswick. Okay, very, very oh. cool. And how are things out there these days? Uh, not too bad. They had a big spike today, so everybody's upset everything's going orange again but okay through it. <laughs> yeah well there's light at the end of the tunnel that's for sure you're right yeah you're right. just gotta stay in our halls and hi Mimi how you doing yeah. hey how's it going very good how's great to see you thanks for joining us of course I'm excited yeah this is awesome now there's still probably a few people gonna show up but uh, there was a couple of people that said they couldn't make it tonight it doesn't really matter because uh, I record all these sessions 
and I post them up on YouTube. Uh, so you can access the whole class anytime you want and uh, go through all the material and, and, and stuff like that. And I also post all the material that we try to learn up there so you can access it anytime you want as well. But uh, anyway, so we might as well get started. So <clears throat> it's great to see everybody. Thanks so much for, for showing up here on Zoom. Uh, I'm Dan McDonald uh, that you saw in the post there. Some of you guys already know me and have been uh, learning from me for a while. Other people are brand new and from different, completely different places. So it's really cool. I'm really enjoying this so far. Um, anyway, so we have a couple of people that are right out of the box. So we got Stacy, who's right out of the box, and we got Mimi, who's right out of the box. Is that right, Mimi? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is, is there anybody else? Oh, Heather, you're right out of the box yeah. too. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> and Deborah, you've been playing a bit already. Yes. Okay, yeah, cool. Off and on over twenty years, but oh, I've wow. played for a couple, so. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Well, you know, it's a, it's a lifelong, playing the fiddle is a lifelong endeavor. There is a, a famous quote by Yehudi Menuhin. Somebody asked him, how long does it take to master the violin? And he said, uh, <clears throat> he said, well, the left hand, about 10 years. The right hand, nobody's finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> So get used to it. It's okay. It, it, it is fun. The process is fun. And so there's, there's a lot to get out of it for sure. Anyway, so let's just start talking about the fiddle. So maybe I'll start off by just playing a couple of tunes just to give you uh, the sound and the feel that we're going to be going for. Now, I'm from Cape Breton Island. Uh, this is where I, uh, oh, oops. this is actually where I grew up right here uh, in uh, Boysdale and in, uh, in Cape Breton on the Bredore Lakes there. And so we played mostly Scottish music. This is my, actually, this is my dad and my brother here playing fiddle in, uh, in Rothbury in England uh, back in 1988. Uh, so yeah, so they were fiddle players as well. And so we played mostly Scottish music growing up in Cape Breton, but we played a bit of Irish too. And since I moved to Toronto, Toronto is a city where you must play Irish or die. So uh, I play plenty of that as well. So maybe I'll give you a couple of tunes here. I'll just play a couple of uh, jigs. Uh, one of them is one that the class uh, has learned <clears throat> already. And, uh, and then I'll, I'll play, I'll, the first one I'll play is an Irish one. And the second one I'll play a Scottish one. And you guys can just get those two sounds in your head right off the bat and just have that ringing around for the rest of the decades that you plan to play the fiddle. All right. So first of all, I'm just going to start by muting everybody so that we don't get confused by sounds. And then I'm going to play a couple of jigs.
you very much. Okay, I'm just going to unmute. Now, how do I unmute? Oh, and i got to let Lena in. Okay, cool. So that was uh, the Swallowtail jig followed by a tune called The Rover's Return, which is a Scottish jig that I've been playing since I was about... I don't know, 10 or 11 or something like that. So, and, and could you hear there the contrast between the two styles of music that, would, that I mostly deal with? Did you hear how the one is different from the other? Everybody hear that? And I picked two that were kind of starkly different to show you the, the little kind of, kind of bit of approach that we use for the, for the two different kinds of music. But anyway, so that's what we're dealing with and that's what we're gonna end up playing. Like for instance, that first tune there, uh, a lot of these guys have already learned, okay? And we learned it pretty well by ear. Now I'm still gonna give you uh, sheet music for everything that we're learning and some of it I actually mark in the fingers you need to use if you need that uh, and stuff like that. But we will do all the music by ear and we'll split it up into phrases so you can hear the phrases and, uh, and, and attempt playing them, okay? But before that, we better start with uh, like uh, how the thing works and how you get it working, okay? So <clears throat> first of all, here's the fiddle, the violin. The fiddle and the violin are the same instrument. It's often a question I get asked at workshops or whatever, what's the difference between a fiddle and a violin? And I always say it's the same instrument. This is a 1953 German, West German violin. Uh, and uh, the only difference is that uh, with the fiddle you play folk music on it and with the violin you play uh, classical music on it. Although a lot of violinists that I know call it a fiddle as well. So really, and the funny thing is, is that the word fiddle is just a really old German word that means violin. So uh, I'm not really sure how it caught on, but anyway, so here's the fiddle. So it's a violin. And it does have certainly as a few parts, okay? And the way that the violin works is just like an old speaker from back in the old days when they didn't have any speakers. So, and it's made of two different kinds of wood. The back and the sides are made of maple and so is the neck, okay? And the top, which they call the belly, is made of spruce. And that's the basic setup of a, of a fiddle. So the reason that works that way is that the back, may, being made of maple, it's a hardwood and vibrates fast. So it puts out the high frequencies from the high strings, the two high strings, these two, the E and the A string. And then the top of it, the spruce top, is made of softwood, vibrates slowly. And so that puts out the low frequencies from the D and the G, just like that, see that? So basically you got the, the tweeter and the woofer, uh, but it's the 1700s, so you have to make the music by yourself, you know, or get somebody to do it or something like that. So that's how the violin works, and that's how we get the frequencies out. And there's a few things involved in that, but I'll tell you, the violins have been around for hundreds of years, and the design hasn't changed for a long time. So what we got, I'll, t I'll start with the parts, and I always start with the parts. So the very top of the fiddle here, this curly Q thing, is called the scroll. And the violin maker, it's usually the kind of the first thing that he starts on is to cut the scroll. It takes a lot of pride in it and it's his signature. And it's really funny to me because the only purpose it serves is to hold up the fiddle while the varnish is drying. That's all it does. But for some reason they're really into it. And that scroll is a Rudolf Buchner from West Germany. That's his scroll there. See that? And it's kind of chunky. The German scrolls are a little bit chunkier than say a French scroll. And this is my father's violin. It's an 1895 Frenchie. It's beautiful. It was looted in World War II and brought back to Cape Breton, uh, rolled up in a blanket. And my dad bought it from the local wood yard. The guy who owned the wood yard was a fiddle enthusiast and so bought and sold them. And he bought it when he was 17. And it's a Frenchie. And you can see the difference right away between the two scrolls. One is very dainty and the other one's quite kind of chunky. See that? And you can see it in the neck as well. The French neck is very narrow compared to the German neck, which is quite sturdy. And so you can see there, there's a little bit of a difference between the, the way that they uh, make the violins. So that's the scroll. And then it connects to this thing called the peg box. And that's kind of where the business is with the pegs. And that's what we use to tune our violin by tightening them or loosening them to make the pitch go up or down. And then this, these are the strings, of course, and we have four of them on a violin. And they go over this little thing here called the nut. Okay, and that's where the little bridge that your 
strings go over to go down and over this black thing called the fingerboard. And that's where we put our fingers. See that? That sits on top of this piece of maple, usually made from the same piece as the back and the sides. And that's called the neck, and that's where you put your hand while you're playing. The strings go over this little piece of wood here. It's usually made of elm or sycamore, and it's uh, uh, called the bridge. And it's really the most important part of the fiddle because it transmits the sound from the strings down through the sound post in the bass bar to the box. And if you got a really nice, well-fitted bridge on your crappy rental fiddle that you got from Long and McQuaid, then it's gonna sound as good as that violin can sound. And if you take, take a cheap, chunky two by four, like my buddy Kim used to call the crappy bridges that come with the cheap fiddles, and you slap that on a Stradivarius, that Stradivarius is gonna sound as bad as it's ever sounded in its long life, okay? So the bridge is really the linchpin of the instrument. And we talk about it a lot because proximity to the bridge is where we start to get our sound quality and our sound production. So we talk about the bridge a lot. So it's good to get to know it. Uh, and then the strings attach to this thing called the tailpiece at the bottom here. See that? And that attaches to the fiddle with this thing here called the button. It's a little piece of ebony. And it's just a friction fit. They just shove it in there and, and that's how the strings get strung on the fiddle. These holes here are called F holes and it's where the sound comes out. Okay. Now the fiddle has gone through a lot of changes over the years. The, the sound hole used to be just a round thing like this. Uh, and it was very quiet. And then there was some crescent shaped ones as well, also very quiet. And it was like the early 1700s or mid when Stradivarius actually came up with the length and the design of this F hole that proved to be the loudest and most powerful design. And that's what we've been using ever since. And my friend uh, Dave Papazian in Cape Breton, he still does them by hand, freehand, draws the F holes onto the wood and cuts them out. It's pretty cool. So that's where the sound comes out in the F holes. This is the chin rest here where you put your chin, but I don't know why they call it that because they really should call it a corner of your jaw rest because that's what goes in there. See that? If I put my chin on it, it would be very difficult to hold, very awkward. So I don't know why they ever called it that, but it is called the chin rest and that's where you put your chin. Okay. Now I use something on my fiddle called a shoulder rest. Most Violinists and fiddle players need to use a shoulder rest, especially adults. My brother Sean did his violin degree without using one, uh, but my dad started using them as soon as they were available, and he'd been playing since the 40s, so most people do need one. I really like mine. I never used one growing up, but then I started to have all kinds of problems with my left arm after prolonged periods of playing, and I ended up having to use one, and I use one regularly now. This is an Everest. It's a really good one. It's my favorite kind. And, uh, and it helps me hold the violin up so I don't have to use my arms to hold it. You can just sit there comfy. I can leave my head. I could have a nap on this thing right now. It could be like a travel pillow, you know? And that's the way you hold the violin. Anyway, so that's the parts of the violin. Now, there's a couple of parts on the inside, and I always like to point them out because it's really how the violin works. So, like I said before, the back puts out the high frequencies and it gets the sound from the high strings, the E and the A, through the sound post. And if you look in your F hole, you'll see something that looks like a pillar. And that's called the sound post. And that's a little piece of semi-hardwood that brings the vibrations down to the back of the instrument, okay? Now, if you look under the low strings, the bass strings, you'll see that there's a kind of a piece of wood. It looks like a floor joist, like a beam up in your basement like that. And if you were inside the fiddle, that's what it would look like. You, it, it goes perpendicular to the top. It's about that long and it spreads the low frequencies across the soft wood. Okay. So those are the parts that are inside the, the sound post and the bass bar. All right. Now, is there any questions about that before we go on? Anything at all? I love questions but I do like to get on with it too, especially since some of these guys have heard this already, but you know, we talked about it last week. It's always good to review, especially the holding part. Anyway, so that's all the parts of the violins. I'll just run them down quick again. Scroll, pegs, peg box, the neck, the fingerboard, the nut, the bridge, the tailpiece, the chin rest, the F holes, and this is the belly, and that's the back. Okay, everybody got all that? Now, 
Here's the bow. Now the fiddle, for, despite all of its complicated parts and complete mastery of craftsmanship, is nothing compared to the bow. <laughs> this is the real hard part of playing the fiddle or the violin, either one. Fiddle players and violinists struggle with the bow. If you ask any of the great fiddle players what was the biggest thing that bugged them about their playing, they would say their right arm. That's what they call it, fiddle players call it. And uh, if you, they, well, I've seen videos of people asking the great violinists about, about what bugs them the most about their playing and they say the bow arm. It's, a, it's the lifelong challenge. Nobody's ever happy with it because it's where the rubber meets the road. It's where you make your sound. It's where you're pulling out the sound out of the violin. That's what my, a teacher used to describe it once, pulling the sound out of the violin. And I always thought that was a great way to put it, you know, and it reminds me of the way that the Irish people call stretching out a tune on the fiddle. That's what they call it. And I think that's a great way to look at it because you really are coaxing the sound out of the strings with this mysterious, simple machine called the bow. Now it has a few parts now, I always like to point out that the people that I buy bow from, buy bows from, uh, they don't make fiddles. And the people that I get to fix my fiddle, they don't fix bows. They're two different things. They take equal amounts of time to learn how to make. And so it's quite, quite a, a machine. So it has just a few simple parts. This is the tip. This is the, the stick. This here is the grip. This is the frog, okay? I never knew why they called it that, and somebody told me once it was because this design of frog, which there was many designs of frogs, different shapes, and there was one where the hair wraps around a marble inside the, inside the wood, and none of them really took hold. This one took hold, and we've been using it ever since, and it was a French guy that came up with it back in the, back in the early 1700s, and that's why it's called a frog. It's kind of disappointing, but anyway, that's what it is. So the three parts, the tip, the stick and the frog, and this is the tightening screw. When you use the tightening screw, you send the frog up the bow to loosen it, you can kind of see it there, and then this way to tighten it. And that's what you do with the bow. Now, everybody always asks me, how tight do you have the bow when you play? I loosen my bow every time I put it in the case, which I haven't done in about nine months because, or 10 months because of the pandemic. My fiddle just hangs here on the wall, doesn't go in its case at all. But when I was playing, I would loosen it off every time, and then when I took it out of the case, I would turn it three to five times usually. So one, two, three, for, for tonight, it's about almost four, okay? And it gets to be about that tightness. See that? Now I wish I could, if we were here in person, I would let you come and just feel the tightness, because the, the violinists, violin teachers over the years had all kinds of ways of saying, put your finger there, don't touch the hair, just kind of gauge it with your finger. And I always found that no good. I just had to go and feel it and see if it was the right tension. But you shouldn't touch your hair. But anyway, so that's what I do. And then when you're finished, you loosen it off three to five turns usually. Okay. Now, if you tighten it up and the bow goes the other way, it's too tight. All right. If you tighten it up and it's flat, it's also too tight. It should always have this curve in it that the bow maker puts into it by heating it up over an iron and doing this over his knee until it gets to the right, the right curve to be the right tension. So anyway, so that's how the bow works. Oh, and this is horse hair, obviously. It's a horse's tail. Most of the horse hair comes from northern Mongolia where there's these horses that for hundreds of years just wander around and get their tails cut off once in a while. It's an amazing thing. And it's a, it, that's the prized hair anyway. And uh, yeah, and the way that it works is, is that you put the rosin on it, and this is rosin. It's dried tree sap. Most of you will have gotten a little cake of it in your case when you got your fiddle, when you, when you rent your fiddle. And this is what it looks like. It's dried tree sap mixed with linseed oil and other compounds. All the makers have their own secret formulas. And the reason that you use it is, you put, I should put a little on today actually. It's one thing about the pandemic is I find I never rosin my bow because I feel like I'm not really playing, but I do teach all day. And so once in a while I notice I need to rosin it. So anyway, so here we go. I'm putting a little bit on there and that's plenty. And it just adds a little bit of stickiness to the surface of the horse hair. And that creates, when, you, when it pulls along the hair, if you looked at it under the microscope, 
the hair would go over the string and look like this. And as you pull the bow along, it twists that string and lets it go. And it's called a slip grip cycle. Slip grip, slip grip, slip grip. It does that over and over and that's how it makes the sound. Let's see if I'll show you. See that? And that's how it makes the sound. So that's why if you don't have enough rosin, it will sound very slippery, very slick and very faint. And if you have too much rosin, it sounds very grabby. See if I can like that because you're not getting a slip grip slip grip you're getting a different variation it's like <laughs> okay so that's what rosin is and that's what it's for and that's how the bow works to make the sound that we get out of the violin okay so just a few simple parts tip stick frog tightening screw grip horsehair okay now we're going to probably refer mostly just to the ends of the bow when we're talking about using the bow and how to use it we'll just talk about each end for the most part but it's good to know those parts now let's talk about holding the fiddle first of all how about one of my students that has already been taking the class for a couple of months hold your fiddle for us okay pick her up and put her on your shoulder and let's see how you do it Oh, that's really good. So Sherry did a great job there. The three st simple steps of holding your fiddle. The first step, put it on your left shoulder. And I hope, is there any lefties here? I teach one lefty who actually plays left-handed fiddle. And I keep forgetting and saying the wrong hand all the time. But we got, everybody's a righty here? Okay, good. Anyway, so you put the fiddle on your left shoulder. You turn your head slightly so that you're looking down the fingerboard at the scroll and then you tuck that corner of your jaw into the chin rest and you let your head just lean on the fiddle like that. And it should be so that you don't have to use your hand to hold it up in the air and you don't have to clench your chin into it to hold. You should be right now, like I said before, I am totally relaxed. Okay. My arms and my shoulders and my neck, everything is totally relaxed. Just like that. That's looking good, Sherry. Very good. Now, Stacy, you look like you're getting along okay, but the fiddle keeps doing this, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Now, that's probably because you need a shoulder rest. Yeah. I can see that you don't have one. And that's what happens when you don't have one at all. That's, that's kind of what happens. See that? That's what it wants to do. And it's just because the space between your, your chin and your shoulder is a little bit too big for it to comfortably kind of go over there. And like I said, I don't know very many people that don't need a shoulder rest. So I'm sure that would probably help that right away. But for now, you just kind of, the Yehudi Menyon used to call it a, a balancing act. So you kind of balance it on your shoulder and try not to use very much energy. That looks pretty good there. That looks good. And also, if you're worried about dropping it, you can put your hand right here for now. Okay? That's, they call that the upper bout. Okay? So you can just put your hand. That looks great. Yes. That looks great there, Heather. Re oh, that's really good. You're getting it really good there. How about you, Mimi? Now, can you drop your hand? Oh, that's great. You got her down. Very good. Who else is brand new? Deborah, how are you doing? Can you hold that? Oh, good. Very good. Elizabeth's good, too. Everybody's looking great. Now, let's practice it a few times, okay? So take her down, do the fiddler rollout. You have to do in the second hour of the dance. And slap her up there again. See how she goes. That's great. Okay, very good. And let's just practice it one more time. Okay. We'll put her up there. And the thing is about holding the fiddle is that it's going to be very intuitive to you and your body and your shoulder. Because like I said, it all has to do with the gap between your chin and your chest. And that's what the shoulder rest does. You can see the shape of it there. It comes down to meet your chest. See that? And it pushes up on the fiddle like this so that it, you don't have to kind of fight that flopping down. So the shoulder rest is adjustable. You can adjust it in a few ways. You can adjust the angle of it like this, okay? You can adjust the height of it by turning the legs in and out. So if this little, if the part that's, uh, that comes down to your chest is not long enough, then you can turn it out to meet that, 
that uh, distance, okay? And that's the, it's adjustable that way. And also, if you look really close, where you put the legs on the shoulder rest, you have three choices there. There's three holes. So that's according to how wide your fiddle is and where you need the shoulder rest according to your body. So for me, I just kind of put her on here like this. I have a little bit of an angle where it's kind of angled down that way. And I discovered that angle after about six months of using the shoulder rest. So you do have to play with it until it works and it could take a while. For me, it took, for me, I didn't com feel comfortable until I was using the shoulder rest for about nine months to a year. And I started using one when I was 25, whereas I never used one growing up in my life ever. It just sat there just fine. But then I took time off of playing about eight or 10 years. And when I went back to it, everything was different and I had a lot of problems. So I started with a sponge, then I went to a kun, then I went to another kind, and then I settled on this kind here. This is what I use now, and it really works. But it took time to figure out how to make it work, okay? So if you need to figure that out, spend the time. It's well worth it. It should be such that you take the fiddle, put it there, and it's there, just like that, without a whole lot of screwing around or tension. So that's the fiddle. Holding the bow. Now, I'm going to give you two options here. There's the what they call the beginner method of holding the bow and the regular method of holding the bow. I should point out, because somebody's going to notice at some point or other, or probably already did, that I don't do either. I do a weird thing that happens after I'm playing for about a bar. And my hand does this thing, and it's just my bow hold, and I wish it wasn't. My, my brother Sean has the real proper classical bow hold and I do feel like he can do more things with the bow than me and it kills me on a daily basis it makes me lose sleep so I do wish I could I, I had a good bow hold but I will show you the good bow hold all right so this is what it looks like this is the proper classical bow hold which I still swear is the easiest way to hold the bow and the most control you can have over the bow now you'll even see with the classical guys they all hold it differently this is the way you're supposed to do it, but there's variations for everybody, okay? So I'll just show you what the, what the deal is with it. The thumb comes up under the stick like this and forms like a fulcrum for the bow so that it can kind of rock back and forth. See that? So you want to avoid sticking your thumb through or using the flat part or have intention like that. It should be curved as much as you can to allow for kind of your, your bow hold is your shock absorbers with the bow and the and the road you know it's what kind of takes in all the shock that happens so always want to be curved so the bow, the thumb curves up under and that's the fulcrum that's its job the first finger goes right around the whole stick and goes under it a little tiny bit too because it has four jobs okay these two fingers here they just kind of lay against the frog and the pinky goes on top. And again, everything's nice and curved and C-shaped. You see that? I can stick my finger through there. See that? And that's the proper bow hold. Now, the reason that, that we do it like that, that I said that this guy has four jobs. The first job this guy has is to bear down. And we all kind of know about that. People that have been playing for a while, you know about that, right? Bear down on the bow. They call that weight. Now, some people call it pressure, and I always kind of go like this because my dad's teacher used to say, you never press on the bow. You always pull the bow. Up bow or down bow, you always pull it. You never press on it. And I really like that because it's true. What they refer to this bearing down, they refer to it as weight. And I really like that much better because it's gentle. And the weight is always combined with motion. See, it's kind of the circular motion that you use to bear down on the bow so that you're not ever pressing on it okay so that's its first job and what it does the most it also picks up on the bow using the end of your finger you can kind of curl it up and pick up on the bow see that very good to practice these little moves by the way if you want a lot of control on your bow so that's its second job is to pick up the third job it has is that if I hook it in a little bit, just a little bit, it steers in towards me. See that? So I can steer it in a little bit. And then if I push gently against it with my thumb, then out it goes. See that? And I use that curl to, to control it like a spring. 
So it has four jobs, bear down, pick up, steer in, steer out. So that's a busy job for the uh, first finger there. And that's why if you go and look at fiddle players on the internet or on YouTube, you'll often find that they only have the two fingers on the bow and the thumb underneath because they're boiling it down to the bare elements. That first finger, which is doing all those jobs, and the thumb. And everything else they can kind of leave to the wayside because fiddle players mostly play eighth notes, okay? Eighth notes are best to play up in this part of the bow. It's called the fiddling sweet spot. It's where the weight of the stick is just enough to make a sound. All I got to do is put that there and it gives me a decent sound. See that? I don't have to adjust. I don't have to bear. Do anything at all. It's just right. I could hold it with a boxing glove and it would still make a decent sound. So fiddle players spend all of our time up there because we're always going downy, uppy, downy, uppy, downy, uppy, downy, uppy. And also, when I get that going, I don't have to use my pinky. So that's the other job. So these two guys have a job. Their, their job basically is to control the pitch of the bow, which is where the bow goes like this on the strings. And everybody has a little bit of pitch to their play and you can't really get away without it. But these here are like a guardrail to kind of keep it to a minimum. They also help a little bit in the picking up, if you can see that, see that? Then the pinky, the pinky has one job, and that is to counteract the weight of the stick. See that? It's all it does. So if I'm playing up here all the time, I don't need my pinky, because I don't need to counteract the weight of the stick. And it also helps me because now I can get like a full dotted quarter note without moving my arm. See that? But then if I do get to the bottom of the bow, my pinky gets engaged because I really have to fight that weight of the stick flopping around. See that? So that's why you might see fiddle players playing with this boiled down kind of bow hold, kind of like mine, a little bit like mine, where you're just kind of bare, boiling it down to the bare elements that you need because you're only playing mostly either quarter notes, eighth notes, or the occasional dotted quarter note. It's about as long as you got to get. See what I mean? So that's why we hold the bow like that, and that's the jobs of all the fingers. So I'll just talk about it once more. Thumb up under, first finger curled around with the knuckle on top, and a little bit of the first finger hopefully under the bow. Might not be achievable right now, but you keep at it. These two fingers here laying up against the frog, and the pinky on top in a nice curved way. I can poke my finger through it. It feels relaxed. It doesn't feel tense. <laughs> It feels nice and relaxed, okay? Now hopefully everybody here can handle that. And the people that already learned it off me, I can see that you're practicing it, and that's really good because you can never practice too much of these bow moves, okay? Now, let's talk about the beginner bow hold. If you can't manage the proper bow hold at first, there's a very effective way to get started, which is to put your thumb on the bottom of the frog on the flat, okay? very gently and again curved and c-shaped and just spread out your fingertips along the top of the bow along the top of the stick like that just spread them out with a little space between them and you keep this c-shape you see how that's still there this c-shape this gap there and the fingers are still curved and that's going to get you started okay so if it's absolutely hopeless with the other way you just try the beginner way and that'll get you started and we'll work on that bow hold and get it working for you all right so let, let's practice that bow hold again so and you just shake it with your hand a little bit so you get the thumb you curve it up under you put that first finger around and under these two fingers here hang out and the pinky on top whoops <laughs> okay and that's her it's looking great there Mimi perfect you must see a violinist from time to time hanging around lurking Let's see, how about Stacy? Now that's looking really good, Stacy. Now the th only thing is you want to avoid, basically you want to avoid too much of your fingers wrapping around the whole bow, okay? Try to use as little of your fingers as possible because you need them for these kind of push-ups and these, these uh, uh, aerobic exercises that your fingers are gonna end up doing, okay? But, but in terms of positioning and the curvedness, looks really good. That looks much better. That's going to work out there, okay? And practice that a few times. Now, is there anybody else that's brand new? Just those two guys? Oh, Heather, looking really good. Okay, see if you can get your, your pinky to be a little bit more curved. 
not so straight. Oh, that's good, yep. Yeah. And see if you can get that first finger around even more under the stick. Yeah, okay, that's gonna work out great. So everybody practice that once more. And I'll look at, next time I'm gonna look at the other guys who. Looking good, Elizabeth, very good. Again with the pinky, yeah, you just wanna make sure that's curved if you can. And I'm gonna tell you, it's hard. It's the one thing that most people fail at is the pinky. And I hardly use mine ever. So uh, I wouldn't count myself as uh, unfailed in that regard. Looking great, Sherry. That looks great. Now that's coming along nice, eh? Is it starting to feel comfy? Give me a, give me a few bow push-ups. Yeah. Now Sherry's doing something there called bow push-ups, which is a little exercise I was teaching the class to do. And it's to kind of get your, your control over the bow happening just with your fingers. So check this out. I'm going to hold the bow and I'm going to keep my pinky curved here and against. I really need my pinky for this exercise. I'm going to leave it on there. And then I'm going to extend these fingers straight so that they're all straight down. See that? That's good. Looking good, Mimi. And then I'm going to clutch that bow up into my palm like this. Okay. Yep. Looking good, Elaine. Very good. You've been doing this before. That's good. Let's see yours, Elizabeth. Now you see uh, Elizabeth had a common problem where it kind of goes like that, but you're getting the right idea. You just have to make sure the right parts of your finger are under the bow to pick it up, okay? Yeah, if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and unmute yourself with the space bar and ask me whatever questions you have while we're doing this, because this is the tricky part, okay? So that's the bow hold and that's one way to improve it. Now the other way to improve your bow hold and get more limber using the bow is the spider crawl. So that's where I hold the bow like this and I crawl on up the bow using just my fingertips. See there's space there. Down I go to the tip. And now the hard part, back down I go to the frog. See that? Elaine, you're doing great at that now. It's gotten much better. Sherry's doing it too. That's great. Isn't it hard? <laughs> and then you go back down. Now this is stuff you do while you're watching television, you know, because your spouse is boring or whatever. And so it's just like you do something like this. Keep yourself occupied watching Game of Thrones. Whatever. There we go. Yeah. Everybody's looking pretty good. Now you can't cheat. The here's cheating. Putting your pinky on the other side of the bow. Okay. That is not allowed and you lose if you do that because that's not going to give you the dexterity we're looking for when we need to bow with our fingers in our hand. Now the thing is about fiddle players and it's one of the distinguishing things between fiddle players and violinists is that fiddle players play the, the violin like a drum. So we kind of hit those strings kind of like we're hitting them with a drumstick. Whereas a violinist always has length to every note they play and so their arm is always involved. Okay, I'm going to show you what I mean. So here's what I'm talking about with the arm involved. So that's a violinist playing a tune. Here's a fiddle player playing a tune. See how I'm doing that? Momentary little notes are what we're doing. And it's just kind of where I'm, and I hit that thing, man. I'm known for it. I don't mind doing it. And I'll hit, hit the fiddle like that for like three hours if the butts are moving right. Okay? So this is how, this is how we get dexterity using just the fingers in the hand to play the fiddle for the most part. See that? All those notes I was doing there were done just with my fingers in my hand. And so I get this rhythm going like this and I use my arm to accentuate the rhythm or if I'm playing a jig here deepity uppity 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 and so I'm do, using my arm to do those rhythmic those uh, accented parts but my hand is just flopping everything out just like I'm dancing and that makes for a nice relaxed rhythm <laughs> So that's what's involved with holding the bow and playing the fiddle as a fiddle player. So you're using a lot of your fingers in your hand. You're trying to get as much of a bow 
you're just using your hand as you can and you use your arm only if you absolutely have to okay so now we've gone through holding it how to strengthen the bow hold with those few exercises and why we do it and why we hold the bow that way is there any questions about any of that at all yes Mimi I have a question just about the push-up exercise. Yeah. Because I was having trouble um, actually making a fist around the bow because my sort of middle fingers, I was um, trying to keep them on the frog. But then when I was then clenching up, it's too much on the frog, I guess. It has to be able to go underneath. Well, you don't want it to go all the way, but check out me doing it here. Look. See that? You can see how much they're... Okay. Just the tips. Now, the other thing I should point out is that the old adage used to be that the bow hold should be dynamic, meaning that I'm not gripping it on the sides with my fingers. It's sitting on the tips of my fingers so it can be loose. See that? And that's really essential. That's what Yehudi Menuhin used to say, dynamic, like a trailer hitch. Okay? Trailer hitch, the ball can move as much as it wants in that socket. Doesn't matter. It can do whatever it wants. As soon as it got too, gets too tight, this is what happens to the trailer. See that? So it's a very similar thing. You getting that, Mimi? See what I mean? And it should be very gentle. See here? Let me see if I can get a good angle here. That's the up. You see how my knuckles kind of go down on either side there? And that's the down. Here's the up. That's the down. You getting a good shot of that? Yeah. And that looks pretty good there. That looks like it's going to work. Okay. Just try, just try your best to use as little energy as possible because you're going to need it, right? <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Anybody else have any questions about holding the bow? Because it, it deserves a lot of talking about. No? Awesome. Very good. Now, let's talk about holding them both. <laughs> Okay, so we slap the violin up on our shoulder like this. We get holding it properly like so that it's easy. That's great. And then we pick up the bow. And you can just, when you're practicing the bow hold, it's best to hold the stick with your left hand and hold that bow with your right so you can be gentle and see, take a look at it. Make sure it's right before you let go. It's looking great. Everybody looks great. Great, great, great. Now, when we bow the strings, we put the bow between the bridge and the fingerboard, okay? Now, there's a variance in where you can play in there, but we're going to stay well away from the bridge at this stage to get the best sound, okay? The closer you get to the bridge with the bow, the squeakier it is, but it's also quieter, and that's why they kind of go up there sometimes, but we're not going to. We're going to stay well away from that bridge. And we're going to try not to go all the way over on the fingerboard either. Put the bow on the string at the frog and in a straight line and without using your elbow or your upper arm, you're going to pull the bow to the frog. Like that. Okay. Yep, looking good. And that's the down bow. So when you move from frog to tip, that's a down bow. Okay. And then when you move from tip to frog, that's an up bow. Okay, yeah, that's good. Now, lots of people have trouble moving the bow straight. When they first start off, it kind of looks like this. And you can hear what that does to the sound because what happens is the bow can't properly do that thing over the string that it does to pull torsion the string, and so it slips, and you get that slippy sound. So you need to be as much as you can at a right angle to the, to the strings. Now, don't sweat it if it's a little bit off. It's always a tiny bit off, but you're trying for the right angle, okay? And when you move the bow, you can see now why the bow hold has to be dynamic so that the bow can stay straight as you're moving your arm. And when I'm finished my down bow, this is what my arm looks like. It's straight out in front of me, and my hand is pretty well as far back as it can go, okay? And when I'm finished my up bow, I look like this, a chicken wing. Okay, with my hand fully curled at the top because remember I'm pulling the bow up, leading with my wrist and leading with my wrist down as well. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Now, if you have trouble moving the bow straight, the best thing you can do to improve it is hold the bow properly and go up and down like this in front of your chair. 
And to keep the bow straight up and down, you can see that your wrist moves. See that? And your fingers even react too. And so you do that same movement like this. See that? Okay. Very good. Now, let's do one of the first... Oh, I haven't mentioned the names of the strings. So the strings have names. <laughs> Letter names of the notes that they make. Now, most of you guys here will probably understand that. Sometimes I have students, I have a couple of students that have never even heard of a note name in their life. And so I have to explain that too. But musical alphabet goes A to G. The, each of the strings are one of the notes. The, the skinny one is E, all right? And if you're looking at the piano, it's E5. Okay, the fifth E up from the bottom of the piano. Here's the, the most important string on the fiddle, the A string. It's the one that wears out first. It's the one we play the most. It's the one we hammer on all the time. And the last time I got a set of strings, thankfully, there was two A strings in there. It's great. Because it's usually that you have you get a set of strings and halfway through the life of the set of whole strings, you gotta replace the A because it gets more punishment than any of the other strings. And the reason that is, is because it's the middle of the range of the fiddle. All notes on the fiddle go up and down from the A string. It's home base. If you look at the staff, the A spot on the staff is the middle space. Second space from the bottom is the A. All the notes on the staff are on the A string for the most part. See that? So we get to know that string the most. And the fiddle, the back of the fiddle here, this plate here, is tuned to a big A. And so that's when you go to an orchestra concert, the oboe player comes and plays an A, and all the violinists tune their A to that. The A is the big note of the fiddle. It's the, the, the note that keeps ringing in your ear. Okay, So we get to know it quite a lot. And there's three of them available on the fiddle without having to shift up. So we've got to get to know three of them. Okay, so that's the A string. Here's the D string. That's the bottom of the staff, hanging on the bottom. My, my dad's teacher used to say, D is right lazy. He hangs on the bottom of the staff. He won't even get up on it. He hangs on the bottom. And then this is the big fat G string, and that's the lowest note you can play on the fiddle. Okay, and if you're looking at it on the staff, it's so low that every note on the G string has extra lines on the staff. There are no notes on the G string that don't have extra lines when you're looking at the staff, okay? So E, A, D, and G. Those are the names of the strings. So here's what we're going to do. This is the exercise that these other guys have done in lots of different bowing variations, which we will also get through. And it's to play a down bow and an up bow on each string, starting on the G, getting over to the E, Finishing that and then going back and playing the A, D, G. And look, Elaine's going to do it for us. She's all ready to go and she's going to demonstrate. Do you want to? <laughs> she's very brave. She's from the west coast of, of Cape Breton. She'd do anything yeah. this one. good Elaine sounding really good and solid that's great and that's come a long way from when we started working together me and Elaine Elaine had this problem of crescent shaped bowing which is such a common problem with adults something that adults can fight for like 10 years and that's where the bow does this and it can give you that scrapey sound it can make you touch the other strings when you don't want to and working on that exercise and those, and those uh, flexibility exercises, Elaine got to a much better place with the bow moving nicely straight and giving us a good powerful sound. Did everybody hear that? Okay, so that's the first exercise we're gonna try doing, okay? We're gonna do a down bow and then an up bow, first on the G string and then the D, A, E, back to A, back to D, back to G. All right, let's do it. Keep your helmets on and have a go. Ready, go!
right? Are you all righty? Now, for the most part, looking pretty good. I saw some people who were moving from string to string like this. Now, that's kind of a natural instinct, but we want to avoid it, okay? I move from string to string like this. See that? It's a lot of work to move this way, and it also, a small move at elbow level can put your bow right onto the other string at the string level. See that? So you try to move from string to string using just that move that I showed you with your fingers there, kind of like the bow push-ups. You go from the G to the E, back to the G, without having to move a muscle of your elbow, okay? Now sometimes when I'm playing a tune, say I'm playing Big John McNeil, where the first part is down on the G, D, A string. Okay, and then the second part is up on the high string. Now you see how when I went down there to play the A part again, my hand went over to the G string and my elbow followed a tiny bit to make it more comfortable to be centered over on that half of the fiddle. See that? But then when I go to the, the B part, scale back over to the E and then down she goes again to make, make it more comfortable on the high side of the fiddle. You ever, everybody see that? Now at this point it's going to be hard to control that elbow movement. You might think you're not moving it at all, but it's actually the funky chicken happening, you know? So using the mirror is really good, or the best way to work on it is using the doorway. That's what my brother made me do until I was like 13, and I always say that I don't know how much of it was useful and how much of it was just torture for him to do to us, uh, but it was definitely useful. And it's where you stand in a doorway. So here I'm going to use this antique radio as my doorway. So I'm sitting or standing, standing is always better, in beside the doorway and so that my elbow is just in front of the door frame. So if I move my elbow, if I, if I moved it up and down it would rub and if I moved it back it would bump. See that? And I play those open strings and if I move that elbow I get the bump, the correction bump. See that? And if I move it up and down like this I feel a rub and so it makes me do this instead. And that was really the best thing, and he had us doing that quite a lot, and I think it's quite useful if you, can, if you have trouble controlling it. The mirror is really good too, and also, like using these Zoom formats is great. It's great for me. You know, I'm banging on all the time about people having a straight bow, and half the time I look at my window, and it ain't that straight. <laughs> So it, it can be very helpful as well, like an iPad on selfie mode. Uh, my wife uses the iPad on selfie mode because she plays the tuba and she can't see her fingering hand while she's playing because the tuba's in the way. So she puts, puts the iPad there on music stand on selfie mode and that shows her her fingering hand and she says it's a bit better than a mirror because it's not a mirror image, it's a true image and she can always just hit that red button and record it and look afterwards and see how it's looking, which is so useful and so good to do. Now, how are we all doing bowing the strings? Let's try it again, and this time I'm gonna watch everybody, even the people that have already learned how to do it, and we'll see how it's looking and feeling, okay? So we're gonna do a down bow. So we'll put our bow on the string at the frog, okay? Down at the frog, the other, there we go, the other frog. Okay, so now we're going to do a down bow. Ready, down. Up. Next string, down. Up. Next string, down. Whoops, up. It's hard to look and play. Next string, down. That's looking great. Up. A string, down, up, D string, down, up, and the G string, down, and up. Okay, looking good. Now, that looks for the most part like everybody's starting to get the idea. I see a couple of the same, a little bit of crescent shape bowing. And just remember that you have some control. If you find yourself looking like this at the end of your up bow, all you gotta do is tuck her in a little bit. See that? Now one thing that happens to a lot of people and used to happen to me is when you go to the high side of the fiddle, you tuck your elbow in like this. 
And what it does is this, watch. See that angle? Suddenly I'm at a great big angle to the string. So I train myself to not do that. I, I do it by splaying out my fingers like this to get the bow to correct itself so I don't tuck it in. But I also, I also let myself, I know I'm gonna do it. So rather than fight it, I found a way to kind of make it okay, even if I do do that. See that? So you wanna watch for that. If you go to the high side of the fiddle, try not to tuck that elbow in. Is anybody having any problems? Is it hopeless for anybody? Yes, Heather, is it hopeless for you? Oh, you gotta unmute yourself. You gotta unmute your microphone. Is the high side the G? No, the high side is the E. And when they say the high side, they're talking about pitch. Oh. That's the high side. That's the low side. Okay? All right. Thank yeah, you. No problem. Anybody else? Any questions at all? Yes, Stacy, You were going for the mute button. I can see. No? Okay, good. Does anybody want to show me how they're doing? How about you, Deborah? Do you want to show me how you're doing with getting your sound out of your fiddle? Or Deborah could be frozen. Oh, no, she's not. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's on the bottom of your the zoom window there on the on the left hand side there we go there it is. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, sounds really good. One thing I want you to challenge yourself with when you're practicing this week is to do it in time. Down, up, like that. Try to use the same amount of bow all the time for every note that you do, okay? It's a real strengthener when it comes to sound production, okay? 90% of people's problems when they're trying to get a good sound, when the, you know, it's one thing to play a slow air and ha have it sound nice because you have time to make the, the, the notes sound good. But when the eighth notes are flying around your head and it's 100 beats a minute, you don't have much time to make it sound good, okay? Mo most people, when they're trying to make that sound good, the problem is not using enough bow. So if you can get used to going right from one end to the other all the time, not only does it strengthen your sound, but it's also a rhythmic strengthener. In the Suzuki method, they put a tape mark at the end of the bow, at either end, and in the middle. And this is your quarter note, and this is your eighth note. Well, that's us. For them, it's this is your half note, and this is your quarter note. But for us, it's this is your quarter note, this is your eighth note. See what I mean? Every time. Makes it nice and consistent every time. Okay. Okay. Anybody else want to try it for me? I want to see one of the people brand new. How about you, Stacy? You want to try it? You're brand new. You don't want to? <laughs> That's fine. We'll try it a lot more. How about you, Mimi? You want to give it a go? Sure. I'll be a guinea pig. Right on. I know you're brave. Okay, now, so pretty good. Good thing about what you're doing, you're moving the bow very consistently straight. That's really good. You do have the funky chicken going on. Yeah. Okay, so the doorway is probably gonna help you, probably be the best help. Or I had one lady that just had her spouse watch her arm constantly. And the guy came up to me, to me in a bar, he was an English guy, and he was like, I really have better things to do than watch Zhuzha's arm. <laughs> 
But anyway, so something. You'll need something. Uh, the other thing I was going to say, uh, your fiddle is very flat. Yes. Now, I forgot to tell you guys, if you're going to attempt to tune your fiddle, and even the people that already tune their fiddle might not be aware, there's an order of operation to tune in your fiddle in terms of what string to tune first. You got to tune the A string first, okay? That's why they do that in the orchestra when you notice that. It's because you tune the A string first and then the D and that seats the bridge down evenly on the fiddle. Then you tune your D and your G together, hopefully for you guys it'll just be one string at a time, and you leave your E till the end. The reason is is because they have different pressures down on the fiddle, onto the bridge. The E is tighter than all the other ones put together. The A is the average. The D and the G are quite loose, okay? So if you make changes to the G first, you might cock your bridge kind of like this. You won't see it, but it'll be like that. And then you go and tune your other strings, and you're like, okay, the E's in tune. Now you go check your G, and it's sharp. It's like, what happened? Well, the, the bridge is doing this. See that? So the A first, and then D, and then G, and leave the E till the end. Okay, now that pressure down thing, that's going to become very important when we're trying to get the good sound out of each string. You'll really notice the difference in the tightness of each string. But for now, to keep you from fighting your fiddle and trying to get it in tune in vain all week, just remember to do that, okay? Uh, now, let's see. This time I want to see somebody that's already been doing it for a while. How about Lena? Let's see you doing it, Lena. <laughs> Really, really good. Very good. Now, how did you feel, first of all? That time? Uh, good, but a little um, on the A string, I had a lot of bounce. Bounce, okay, yeah. Now, Lena talks about bounce. When you do your down bow, it might bounce on you. See if I can get it to work. I can never get problems to happen when I want them to happen. It's only when I don't want them to happen. I can't actually make it happen right now, but it's a bounce that happens on the bow. I can't do it. <laughs> anyway, it kind of bounces, it kind of goes, kind of like that, you hear that? As you're moving along. Very common problem, it's only on the down bow. The reason it happens is because the, this is a leaf spring on a car. When you go over the little bump, your leaf springs bottom out. If you go too quick afterwards, it'll go bang, bang, bang down the road. See that? So you got to kind of bring in this weight here. As you bottom out, you bring in the weight, and then you let that car go over the hump like that. See that? And you move it. You get it out of there. That's how you avoid a bounce. Okay, Lena? And you got to get the timing right. If you do it too early, it bounces. If you do it too late, it bounces. So you got to finesse it. But I, I thought that was pretty good. The only problem I heard was that you were riding the danger zone of too close to the bridge the whole time. You managed to keep it from squeaking, but why do all that work? Okay? It would try staying well away from the bridge. You can see on my fiddle, my rosin marks, where I usually play. And it's usually just about here. Okay? And that has to do with getting the sound out of the strings. You can hear it by the plucking. If I pluck it here, nice free plucking, you hear that ringing sound? If I pluck it here, it's pinched, you hear that? And the bow does the same thing. Now, real good violinists, they can play up there and it makes them very quiet in a nice gentle way, but for the most part when you're first starting off, just stay the hell away from there. It's the, the kids up in Wikwemakong and Manitoulin Island, the native kids, they call it the death zone. <laughs> Love that. So stay away from the death zone. Anyway, so anybody else want to try it for me so I can talk about them, how good it is and how bad it might be? No? Let's try it again. One more time. Okay. Down bow and then an up. A one, and watch that elbow me, that's better. One, two, three, go. Two, three,
awesome. That looked really good. Everybody getting along okay now, for the most part? Okay, any questions at all before I move on to putting the fingers down? Any questions at all? My favorite color or anything? Who's that guy, for instance? Anything? No? Right Who's to you. That guy? Sorry? Who is that guy? This guy is Michael Coleman. He was an Irish fiddle player from County Sligo, and he lived in the 1890s, uh, that area of time. And uh, he immigrated over to uh, New York uh, in 1895. And uh, he made, he was a fiddle player, he was wicked. He, he is the typical of, that you think of, of the I West Coast Irish style of playing the fiddle. Very closely related to flute playing. And uh, he made these records just for drinking month money in 1916. And they went 1916 style viral. Uh, and uh, made their way back to Ireland from New York. And so now he's kind of revered. And, you know, you, you call yourself a follower of Coleman. And certainly my family were followers of Coleman. And I was at his home village a few times. The first time I went there with my father. And the biggest building in town is the Coleman Cultural Center. <laughs> so anyways, I got him up there because uh, that's kind of the, my Irish side. And that's what my family grew up listening to in terms of Irish music with him. So, so I got my dad and my brother and Michael Coleman. <laughs> Anything else? Any questions at all? So we're going to put the fingers down now. Okay, let's do it. Now, I should talk about tape. All right? A lot of... Anybody here? Anybody that was in the class originally? Okay, so Sherry has got tape on her fiddle. See that? Okay? That's the traditional way that you start off playing for most people. All right? Now, I don't think I had tape on my fiddle. I can't remember. Suzuki, they do it right away. They tape up the fiddle right as soon as it comes out of the box. And you can too. It can be a very useful way to get your fingers working quick and easy. And eventually we take the tape off. Now basically the, the reason that you have the tape there is because it shows your finger where to go. That's the problem with playing the fiddle. You know, they always say the fiddle has all the problems. It has sound production because you got this damn thing that's so hard to use. So sound production you got rhythm, you got pitch, and that's like the big kicker of the actual fiddle part, not the bow part, is making the right pitch, being in tune. That's what the way what they call being in tune. So here's a note that's in tune. That's a D in tune, bang on the money there. Here it is a little tiny bit out of tune. You hear how horrible that sounds? It's dismal, it's depressing, it's horrible. That's called flat. That's not high enough. It actually makes me drowsy. When I was teaching so much in person, I always used to say that the flat fiddle all day makes me want to go to sleep. I don't know what it is, but that's flat, okay? Here's in tune again. Lovely, it's ringing. That's another thing. The fiddle is built to ring out a few notes. They call them the fiddle keys. D, G, and A. So when you get those notes in tune, the note rings for another 20 years afterwards, and that's what happened here. Still going. See that? So when it's flat, you don't get that. You get nothing at all. See that? So here it is in tune again. Oh, it's lovely. Hear that? Now, this is sharp. Hard to hear the difference, isn't it? Not like flat. Flat was instantly recognizable, but sharp is just, it's a little edgy. Did everybody hear the difference there? It's small, but that's sharp, okay? And those are the two ways that you can be out of tune on the fiddle. In other words, your, fi your finger is not quite in the right place. So the reason that we use, now Mimi here is a singer, she really knows more than anybody about being in tune. Because on the fiddle, at least we have these four references, which are my life preservers in life. I know that they are in tune, as long as I tune my fiddle before I start playing. I know I can count on those notes to be in tune. But a singer has nothing. Isn't that right, Mimi? Zero. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs>
<laughs> so that's why the fiddle is not unlike that because these four notes that are available between the two strings could be anywhere on the fiddle. They could be up here, they could be down here, who knows? A tiny movement means a completely different note on the fiddle, even pressing. If I press really hard, it makes me go sharp. If I loosen that pressure, it makes me go a little bit flatter, okay? Will affect the intonation. So you need a place to start. So the tape is a great place to start. So show us your fiddle again there, Sherry, where you got it taped up. Okay, so you can see here that her fiddle is nicely taped up. There, there's a good gap between the nut and the first piece of tape there, okay? And it's a good three quarters of an inch for most fiddles. Like, you'll have to look at it yourself, maybe use a tuner, and you get that piece of tape across there about three quarters of an inch up. Then the next gap is slightly smaller because the gaps between the notes get smaller as you go up the violin. A lot like on a mandolin, which is set up the same way as a fiddle, you see how the frets are closer together as you go up the neck of the mandolin there. Same on the fiddle, except there's no frets, okay? So the second space is not quite as big as the first space. And that's gonna be a whole tone there between those two notes. And then the third piece of tape is right next to the second piece of tape. See, so your fingers look like this on the fiddle. And that's what we call first position. It's the first spacing that we use because that gives us three keys. Watch this, G. for all of those three keys. See that? Those are the fiddle keys. That's why. G. D. A. Those are the three scales we can play right off the bat with that simple first position. So if you need to tape up your fiddle, you should. If you were taking les lessons with me in person, I would do it for you to make sure you don't end up doing it wrong. There's several ways to do it wrong. One of the ways to do it wrong is to buy one of those templates at Long and McQuaid that goes under your fiddle because it's got a marker for all 57 notes available on the fiddle. You do not need that right now. That's way too confusing. You just need those three pieces of tape if you need them at all. And we'll see if you do. If you're putting your finger down and it's kind of in the ballpark, you don't need them. If you find you're all over the place all the time, you might need them. In, in the Suzuki method, they put the three marks on there. The first one to come off is the one. Then the second one comes off, leaving only the third. And that's really good because if you have your third finger in the right place, the second one and the first one tend to be in the right place just as a result. See that, especially descending a scale or a passage. All right, so that's what the tape is for. And I do recommend it if you're having a lot of trouble, just slap some tape on there. One of the other ways you can do it wrong is to use tape that's way too wide because you want to feel the tape under your finger more than anything. You can't really see it. Looking down at your fingers does absolutely nothing to improve your playing, okay? Because as soon as you have your third finger down, you can't see your second or your first. It's all a big line and you can't see the fingerboard. So the tape is more for feeling the edge of it under your finger than you know you're on the tape. You see what I mean? Most people use electrical tape. It's really good because it doesn't leave a residue and it's thick so you can feel it. Uh, or people use the green painter's tape as well, which also works well because it's a different texture than your fingerboard, okay? So, and make sure they're nice and narrow so you can feel that under your finger if you have to mark up your fiddle. Now let's talk about putting the fingers down. So you got your tape on, you put your fiddle up there, and you put your hand, now I was mentioning about the bowing stuff before, the stuff we did with the bowing. If you go back and look at the videos of the previous classes, I do lots of variations of bowing. And if you guys could look at that for next time, then we can go a little bit quicker for everybody else that's already been doing the class. And you'll see it's just the same thing, just done a few different ways. There's this here. There's this here. There's this here. Anyway, you'll see and explore and have fun. But uh, when you're doing those bowing exercises, you can just put your hand here. It's the best way to do it. You won't be nervous about your fiddle falling down and you can really concentrate on that right arm. But if you're putting your fingers down, you put your hand down here. Now the way that you do it, they used to say in the Royal Conservatory days, the left arm should be comma shaped, shaped just like a comma. 
See that? Curved all the way around my fingertips to the strings. If I have this thing happening here, which is going to be your instinct, that's going to do a couple of things. It's going to take your fingers away from the strings. See that? So instead of being over top of the strings nicely, they're going to kind of end up being away from the strings. So you really want to avoid what they call the bookshelf <laughs> or the collapsed wrist. That's what they also call it, which I like that, the collapsed wrist. You don't want that. I knew Jerry Holland played that way with a collapsed wrist and he had to get uh, surgery on his wrist. And my buddy Kim Vincent, he played that way, but his hands were so huge, it was the only way he could get back far enough to be not sharp all the time. <laughs> so for most people, this is the best and easiest way to do it. Continuous curve right around to your fingers. There should be a gap between the fiddle and the crook between your thumb and your forefinger. You don't want the fiddle sitting on that crook because then the instinct is to hold it up. And your left hand is far too busy playing eighth notes to hold up the fiddle at the same time. So you want to be that gap there because the fiddle should be holding itself up. See that? My thumb goes on the side of the neck, not on the flat, but on the side. See that? Right next to the nut. My dad's teacher used to say, the nut's there and then your thumb's there. Just like that. Okay, now it hangs around there. My thumb moves around a little bit, but that's where I'm going for it all the time. Right there, nice and curved and on the side, just like that. So that's how you put your fingers up there to play. When you bring your fingers down, just simply a matter of just bringing them down. See, they're already over the strings and they just come down in a curved way using the front part of my finger. That's the hard part. If you tried to use the flat part, there's a lot of variation and in intonation there. You could put yourself way out of tune. You could be in the right place on the string, but that big fat pad kind of makes you sound wiggly. So you want to use the hard part of your finger. And that's why it's very important to keep your fingernails trim when you play the violin on the left hand, because if you have expensive strings, then your fingernails can go through them before they are dead. And then you have to buy new ones, even though you just got the strings. And so, and the middle finger is the worst one for it because the nail on your middle finger grows faster than the other ones and it's longer. And to get, for most people to get that C sharp or that G sharp in tune, they have to be really pointing straight down at the string. And so that nail can really chop your string in half, basically. So anyway, and I just said that so that you understand the shape and to make sure you trim your nails. Okay. Now, so let's try something. Let's try playing an A major scale. Okay, so that's going to be, we're going to start on the A string. That's right now, the one right next to the skinny one. And we're going to play that open A string. And then we're going to put the first finger down and play that. Okay, I'm trying to get it about three quarters of the way away from the nut. Three quarters of an inch away from the nut. Put that down and play that. And then we're going to try the second finger. Not quite as far as the gap between the nut and the first finger. Play that. Then we're going to put the third finger down almost right next to the, the second finger and play that. Now let's see what happens, okay? So everybody get your fiddle up. Bow on the string on the A string. We're going to do a down bow. Okay, now put that finger down on the string nice and firmly, okay? Now you don't want to smash it down. You want about 70% pressure down. Now play that note. Okay, good. Very good. Yep. Now let's put the second finger down again with 70% pressure about. Nice and firm. Let's play that. Okay. Now you put the third finger down right next to it and hold her down nice and firm. That's your D. Okay. Now let's go over to the E string. Play the open E string. Open means no fingers. Now you put your first finger down, three quarters of an inch, hold her down nice and firm. You can feel now how tight that E string is. Play that. Put your second finger down, nice and tight, play that. And the third. Back to the two. So you take your third finger off now and play that. Take your second finger off, play the one. Take your first finger off, play the open string. 
Now you put all three fingers on the A. Try to put all three down at once in their respective spots and play that. That's your D. Then you take the third finger off and play the two. Good. Now you take that off, play the one. And then you play the open. And that's a G major, or sorry, an A major scale. Okay, we did our first A major scale. Now, how did that feel? Did it work? Were there any survivors? Yeah, good. Okay, let's do it again right away. Okay, so you hold the fiddle up, get your hand out there nice and easy. Very relaxed. Try not to grip the fiddle between your thumb and forefinger because it slows you down and adds a lot of tension. It does not help. So, open A. Ready? Go. First finger down. That's a B. Second finger down. That's a C sharp. Third finger down. That's a D. Open E. First finger down, that's an F sharp. Second finger down, a G sharp. And then the third finger down, that's an A. Play the third finger one more time. That's E3, third finger on E. Now play the two, take the third off and play the two. Take the second off, play the one. Play the open E now. Try to put all three fingers on the A. Play that D. Good. Play the C sharp, which is the two. And now the one. And now the open. Now that looked like it was much more successful for many people. Um, I should mention that when we're playing the violin or the fiddle, there's a couple of approaches, but I like, I do both approaches, which is to number your fingers, okay? So it's a little bit different than piano. With piano, this is one, but we don't use the thumb at all. So this is one for us, okay? This is finger one, finger two, finger three, finger four, okay? So if I say A1, that's your first finger coming down on the A string. See how that works there? If I say A2, that's both fingers coming down on the A string. And if I say A3, that's all three, okay? Now it's very important to try to put down, if you have to put down your two, to put both of them down, okay? Because it forms a shape for your hand and it does a lot of work for you. When I play fiddle tunes, I usually plunk my finger down on a couple of strings and then it's just a matter of a little few little pushes and nudges and I got a tune. Check this out. So if you look at my left hand. See that? Not very much finger movement, lots of music. I put my finger down there and then I just gotta go back and forth, add a few things here and there, and the tune is done. I get my check and go home. See that? You try to work as little as possible because the eighth notes are flying and you got to put life in it and it needs you need to just put as little energy into it as possible. So when you say you're coming down a scale, if you put all three fingers down, that means two more notes in that scale are already there. You don't have to tune them, you don't have to place them, they're already there. So it's a very good habit to get into right from the outset. All right. Now let's try the same thing starting on the D string. Little trickier. The D has fat neighbors, G and D and A. And so you might find your bow keeps touching them and that's probably just going to be your elbow doing too much of the funky chicken. You just got to get her to calm down there and stay. My dad's teacher had a funny way of putting it. He used to say, you don't hold your elbow tight. You don't hold it up in the air. You hold it as if you were normal. That was his little joke. Anyway, so try to hold it as if you were normal. So we're going to start with the open D. Okay, just the open D. Ready? D. Put the one down. Put the two down. Put the three down. A. 
I saw a couple of people do a very common thing when you're first starting to play the fiddle is that you skip the open strings on the way down. So you're coming down, but then you go try to go straight over to the third finger on the next string, okay? And it's just where you're skipping that open string. So you don't, don't forget the open strings, they're the easy ones, okay? Uh, now, I mentioned about the finger numbers, right? But of course, the notes that you're making when you put these finger da fingers down also have names, all right? And I mentioned them when we were going through the A scale. You got the A, then you put the one down and that's a B. Then you put the two down and that's a C sharp, okay? Put the three down and that's a D, okay? They all have names. A lot of people use numbers because Suzuki used numbers. I used numbers when I was growing up. So a lot of people use numbers. A lot of people use letters. So I try to do both and I find it best to have both because then you understand a lot of the things about playing the fiddle like the two halves of your hand. You got the odd number fingers one and three and the even number fingers two and four. And when you're looking at the music these are all the lines and these are all the spaces. You see what I mean? So it is good to have an understanding of that numbering system as well as the notes. And I should let any musicians, legit musicians as it were, know that in the Irish and Scottish tradition, we just assume you know what key you're in. So if I say C, that could mean a C sharp. <laughs> we just say the C. See what I mean? Anyway, you'll get used to it. So that was the D scale there. Shall we try it one more time? Open D to start with. Okay. Ready, open D. D1. It's an E. D2, F sharp. D3, G. Open A. A1. A2. A3. A3 again. A2. A1. Open A. D3. Good. D2. D1. And open D. that feel for everybody. Let's hear from a couple of the new people. Mimi, how are you getting along doing that? Yeah, good. The first time through, um, I, my bow definitely didn't want to go back to uh, the, the D string. Right, yeah, yeah. It was stuck on the A, and then it, but then the second time through, it went, it went better. Oh, that's great. Good. Very good. Now, I'm watching you. Your left hand looks really good. Really, really good. Your right hand, you'll get used to it. Like, you know, and, and the thing is the about all these techniques on the violin, there are so many techniques on the violin that you're trying to, trying to make good, right? It deteriorates. It's like Lent, if anybody's a Catholic. Everybody's really good in the first couple of weeks, but by the end of it, you're sneaking the chocolate all over the place. It's just the way it is. You just kind of get, it gets, it deteriorates as you go along. So just keep that in mind. So when you first started, you had a good bow hold. By the end of it, you had this kind of thing going. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's good to refresh for anybody that's fresh starting off right away. Good to refresh the bow hold every once in a while. You try a scale. Next time you try it, take a look. Just kind of, you know, and then do it. And it'll go, you'll, it'll go much better. Okay. How about you, Stacy? How are you getting along? Yeah, good. My my wrist is killing me. 
Now I can I'm watching you as you're playing, and it does it looks like your wrist is killing you. <laughs> so what it looks like is this. It looks like you have this idea, which I've seen a lot with people learning how to play, which is to hold the bow kind of like this and kind of to kind of point the bow at the string like that, right? And what yeah. you got to remember is the bow sits on the string on its own. See that? I could even okay. do that if I wanted to. And it's a very light, relaxed thing. If you feel you're getting tense, it's just yeah. there's no good reason for it. You just can just relax. Now, a lot of people talk about the benefits of breathing while you play to keep that joint relaxed. And I've found that trying to trying to concentrate on exhaling on the down bow can get you started breathing while you're trying to play. Okay. Does that make sense? So nice and yeah. light. If you feel it, just loosen up. See if you can just loosen up. Okay. It won't affect the sound that much. Don't worry about it. Okay. okay, awesome. Anybody else have any problems with those couple of scales or anything else that we talked about tonight? Or questions at all? Nobody? Okay, now, so in our last little bit of time, first of all, like I said, all the classes that we've done previously are up on YouTube for you guys to try to catch up a little bit in the next few weeks, okay? So we do those three scales. We do A, D, and G. We also do the, uh, the two octave scales. Now there's not, those are one octave scales and hopefully everybody knows what an octave is. But an octave is an eight note scale where you're going from one note to the next of the same note uh, up the octave. So here we go from one A, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. See, that's the upper A. That's the, I can't remember which one it is. Well, I guess it's A5 on a piano, okay? So that's a scale. There's also two octaves, that's one octave, but we also have a few two octave scales available on the fiddle. There's G, A, B flat, B natural, and C. Those are the only ones we can do in two octaves before we have to start going up to the dusty end of the fingerboard, which we're not going to do at this stage. We're gonna stay down first position. So the two scales we do on the videos that you'll see there are G, can see how I had to change my finger position slightly. The two now goes back to here, okay? So that's G in two octaves, and then we also did A. And then we have to make one slight change there too. We gotta stretch the third finger on the G and the D, okay? And I'll let you guys explore that. We'll talk more about it next time and we'll get into those scales. And you'll also see those bowing things that I mentioned, okay? And we also did a few tunes, which we'll eventually get to. Now there's one tune that we could possibly learn tonight, and that's Twinkle Twinkle. Okay, it's traditionally the first one everybody has to learn ever since Mozart, everybody has to learn that one first. Sorry, I didn't make the rules, but there they are. So Twinkle Twinkle is very simple. Now you're gonna watch me do it, and the guys that already know it and already do it, I challenge you there at home, since you're on mute, go ahead and play along. Put your tuners on. I want you to see how you do playing simple old twinkle twinkle with your tuner on, okay? I'm gonna check in and see how people are doing because we've been working a lot on intonation and a simple tune like this is a good way to test and see how you're doing, okay? Anyway, so I'm gonna show you how it goes. We start off with the A string and the E string for the twinkle twinkle. <laughs> Okay, and then we put the first finger down for the little, little star. So little. And then we play the E string for the star. Okay, so that's the first phrase of Twinkle Twinkle. Two A's. Two E's. Two ones. And then a great big long open for the star. And then after that, we put all three fingers on the A string. And then we do the, how I wonder what you are. Isn't that great singing, Mimi? How come I never got a job singing? Anyway, so you put all three fingers on the A string and you do, how I wonder, take off the third finger, play the two, what you, 
and then R is a great big A. All right, now let's see if we can do that, okay? So how did the people do with your tuners? Oh, wait, first of all, I'm gonna play the whole thing. You guys get ready and play. I wanna see how you do, okay? So here is the first phrase of Twinkle Twinkle. Ready, go. E1. Great big long E. A3. A2. A1. Great big long A. Okay. Now that looked like, I only have looks to go by in this day and age, but it looked great. Everybody looked confident and moving their bow without much difficulty. Mimi, your bow looks too tight. Now that's something that happens. When you first pull your bow out, you tighten it up. If it's a wet day, after about a half hour, it might be tighter on you. So you gotta kinda check in on it. It's especially bad in the winter, because you're going in and out of temperatures. So, and that's what happened to you there, Mimi. Anyway, so that was Twinkle Twinkle. Now, how did the people do that already know it with the tuners? Did your tuner, did your tuner like that or was it upset by that? Anyone who wants to chime in? I was very flat. <laughs> you were very flat? Yeah, very flat. Okay, now do you think it was... Well, I haven't played Twinkle Twinkle in a long time. Is that right? <laughs> well, now do you think it was the flat? See, there's different or degrees of flat. So here's your rule of thumb. If you're flat, then the first thing you should do is press harder. Okay, check this out. If everybody has their tuner on there, whoever has a tuner on, I'm gonna play a D. That's a D and it's bang on the money, right in the middle of my tuner. Lighten up green and happy, okay? Now, I have about 70% pressure down on the string with my finger. Now I'm gonna put my finger all the way down. You hear that sharpness? That's like half a semitone that gives me, okay? So if you're flat, your first line of defense should be press harder, okay? If you press harder and you're still flat, then you gotta roll forward on the round part of your finger, okay? That'll give you even more sharpening power. Now, if you're still flat after that, you're gonna to have to move your finger. And you do that last resort. As soon as you start moving that finger around, it's like turning off the GPS in the middle of London, basically is what it's like. You get totally lost in the water. You don't even know where your finger is now, and you don't even know what note you're playing. So moving your finger is the last line of defense. First of all, if you're flat, press harder. If that's not enough, roll forward. If that's not enough, move your finger if you have to. If that's not enough, throw the fiddle out the window and see how it sounds when it hits the ground. I bet you it's pretty satisfying. I've never tried it. Jennifer said she got really close to throwing her tuba out the third floor practice room window down in Bowling Green, Ohio. She was doing her masters because she was pretty sure it would sound better than what she was trying to play at the time, but she didn't do it, so that's good. So that's your defense against flatness. Okay, Lena? Do you think it was just pressing? No, I actually think I had I had to move my finger. You did, eh? Okay. I, it's a tendency that I think I've been slowly I've been slowly moving down and just becoming generally flat. It's such a common that I now need to break. You know, it's such a common problem. It's something I fight in my in my teaching studio constantly. One thing that I'd like to point out though is that <clears throat> when you're working on intonation on the fiddle, it's a two pronged approach. The first prong is to train your ear so that your ear knows what the notes should sound like, okay? That's why in the violin, we start with our open strings, we get to know them, and then when you're properly learning to tune your violin, you play the two strings together because you get to know that interval of a perfect fifth, what it's supposed to sound like when it's in tune. And that's your first stepping stone for your ear. When, by the time you're 11, you can really tune your fiddle well and your ear knows a fifth. And that's our whole life as fiddle players is the fifth, you know? It's, everything is based around, it's like, oh, it's such a beautiful, pleasing sound. See what I mean? And so when you're constantly looking for that with the ear, you're gonna have better results. The other prong to the approach, but eventually when you're finished your ear training on the fiddle, you're supposed to be able to know, get to know every note on your fiddle, all 57, 59 notes available. 
you're, for a good violinist, you're going to get to know each of those notes. For a fiddle player, you know, I got everything on the first position. I got a little bit of third position. I got most keys, but like I never have to play in B major, five sharps, ever, you know. I never have to play in G flat, ever. Those are not things that I ever have to do. So I don't know those notes that well. If I did have to play in those keys with a singer, I'd, I'd sweat it a little bit. I'd have to do some work to my ear to get my ear to know those notes a little bit better. Okay, that's the first prong to intonation uh, attack. The other attack is how it feels. What I'm talking about with finger pressure, what I'm talking about to be in tune, even if the notes are flying, the general feel of the shape of your hand and how hard you press when you're playing in tune. And that gives your hand that tactile message that you're doing it right. So you got the feel and you got the ear. First we train the ear and then the ear starts to tell the hand when things feel good. Do you see what I mean? That's the process of intonation on the fiddle, okay? And that's what we're going to be going for. So we'll keep working on you, Lena. One thing that might be good if you tend, if you find yourself constantly falling down flat is to put the third finger tape on your fiddle. The one piece of tape. Because that, I have a feeling that will straighten out your whole hand in a couple of weeks. Okay? So that's great. So good job. Keep challenging yourself. Anybody else have anything to say about playing that thing in tune? Anybody get along good and is happy with themselves? A bit? <laughs> That's great. So let's try it again. Twinkle, twinkle, A, A, E, E, E1, E1, open E, and then we pile the fingers up on the A string. Okay. A, A, ready, go. E, E. E1 Open E A3 all three fingers 2 1 A Now let's play two E strings okay so uh, uh Whatever the words are, up, high, flying, high above, or whatever. So E E, ready, go. A three. A two. Long A one. E E. A three. A two. Long one. And now we're back to the first phrase again. A A. E E. E one E one. Open E. A three. A2 A1 Open A And that was it. That was your first twinkle twinkle. How do you feel? Stacy, you look like you feel great. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Because my like dog started howling. <laughs> oh, now that's a common problem too. I've heard a lot about that. Cats that hate yes. the fiddle, dogs that hate the fiddle. But I don't know what to say about that, except that they'll get used to it eventually. Yeah, I think that just means I'm really good. That's right. I had one. Uh, I had one cat one time, Angus. I don't know if Mimi ever met Angus. He was a great brown tabby, great big fella. And Jennifer and her friend found him on the road. He was injured. He had a puncture wound in his leg. And there was nobody around, no collar, so they took him to the Humane Society and they fixed him up. Nobody claimed him, so we claimed him, but he didn't like living at our house. He was he wandered around the neighborhood, he went to the bar, which I would never go into. He went to the mafia coffee shop, he went to the hairdresser. That was his best friend, Bruno, was his best friend, but he hated our house. And anytime anybody would start playing the fiddle, he'd go for their bows. He couldn't stand, he loved bows. 
He wanted the bow. You grab at it, freak out. But anyway, so I don't know what to tell you. It's a thing. <laughs> How about you, Mimi? How'd you feel about that? I feel okay, but I think I'm gonna have to really practice finding the third position, especially because I every time I go from the E string to the A string, I, I it's like I'm starting from scratch. I don't quite know intuitively yep. what that is. Now I'm gonna give you a couple tips about that. First of all, big gap between one and two. Big gap. Think big. Okay. The other thing is because your ears already knows what a D should sound like, you would probably get along really well with something called drop downs. So that's where you play, say, your open A, and you bring your third finger down, see where it is. And then if it's not in the right place, do it again, trying to take that into account. And that way you have a chance of practicing getting it right. See what I mean? Yeah, so it's like dropping straight to the third one from the open string instead of doing one, two, three. That's right, three, dropping five, straight there. Five. And then yeah. the thing is, though, don't tune it. Drop it there and see where it is. If it's flat, do it again a little different. And then once you do get it right, see if you can get three or four in there. You know what I mean? Like before it starts deteriorating. And then you practice getting it right the first try. And with the three, it's really important because it means your two and your one are probably gonna be fine. Okay, very good. Awesome, okay, let's try Twinkle Twinkle once more. And then, any, oh wait, before I do that, how about the guys that have been playing for a bit? How did you do that time with the tuner? Better? Yeah? Oh good, see that's great. So this is good for everybody. So for you guys, I want you to really try to get those notes bang on. The nice thing is, for a lot of the notes, you got two cracks at it, right? How I wonder. So if you don't get it right the first time, really try to get it right the second time, probably finger pressure. All right, let's do it again. One more time. A, A, E, E. A, one, two, and here we go. E, one. Open E. A, three. A2 A1 Open E E A3 A2 A1 long confident so I think you'll be able to practice it now this is your chance if there's any questions at all before we finish up for tonight anything about how you're going to carry on this week I'm here to help nobody okay cool well that's great so what I suggest you do when you're at home, first of all, you're going to explore all those videos there on, uh, on uh, what do you call it, uh, on YouTube that I have from our previous classes, and tonight's class will be up there too. And so you're going to, so when you first start, you're going to do that long bow, two bows on each string, okay? And then you can look at the videos on YouTube, see the variations we do with that each string thing, the different ways we bow it. We'll talk more about it next time. Try them out a little bit. See which ones work. See which ones are giving you problems, okay? Then you're gonna do your scales. All three scales. 
probably best to start on the A. A scale, and then the D scale, and then the G scale. So that's open one, two, three, next string, open one, two, three. Now I should mention, some people might use the fourth finger instead of the open string. Because then when you put all four fingers on the string, you're actually playing the same note as the string above the one you're playing. Fiddle players don't use our pinky very much for that. Because check out the difference in sound. That's my E string, or sorry, my A4. Here's my E. See that? So if I got a room full of uh, dancers, you know, I want that open string. I don't want that short string with the four, fourth finger that gives me a warm. It's a very nice warm sound, very beautiful and warm, but it's not what I need as a fiddle player. I want that open string. So I always say I pretty well only use my pinky for uh, the high B, uh, decorations and if I'm in a pinch because it is handy in a few little places you know what I mean so we will get into the fourth finger but for now we're gonna do open one two three next string open one two three that's how we're gonna do it for now okay so practice open string stuff scale stuff have a crack it twinkle twinkle and if you're brave enough to try anything else that's up to you and we'll talk more next time does that sound good Okay, good luck. Don't uh, throw your fiddle out the window. And if you do, try to record it. I'd really like to hear what it sounds like. See you later, everybody. Email me if you have questions. Thanks, Dan. Okay, bye-bye.